this is my uh, very first uh, little episode of um, me talking to, to people in Belconnen who I think uh, you should know or you should get to know or, or know a little bit about. And I'm really honoured that my first guest tonight is Stuart Harris, who is a proud Belco boy. He's a photographer and he's a passionate about citizen science and citizen scientists. Stuart discovered his first, but not the only, species of spider in 2008. And this discovery was documented in the award-winning short film, Maratus. So let's get to know Stuart a little bit better. Um, Stuart also happens to be the winner of our recent light photo competition um, with the most popular photo there, with the, uh, the fantastic um, and beautiful photo of uh, um, the enlightened dead or red, it was titled. That was Stuart's title uh, with a, a, a beautiful... Um, a uh, dead leaf uh, in the Aranda bushland, I think. But uh, I'll, I think I'll let Stuart tell you a little bit about that photo. Can you tell us what inspired you to take that photo, Stuart, and, and how did it come about? Well, uh, I was quite lucky actually, Tara, because, and thank you for, for this privilege. Um, yeah, uh, I'd actually already submitted two photographs um, to the competition well in good time. And on the, the afternoon that it closed, it was a Sunday, I thought, oh, I was going a bit, had a bit of cabin fever, so I thought I've just got to get, get out in the bush. I mean, I do spend an inordinate amount of time in the bush around Canberra and beyond. And so I just uh, went down to Aranda Bushland um, and uh, wandered around, not quite aimlessly, but yeah, just looking for the little stuff that turns up often. And the sun was setting in the west, obviously, and, uh, and, um, as I've seen many, many times before, when the sun's low in the sky, when it goes through young eucalyptus leaves on a sapling, some of them, some of the colours that uh, it produces in those leaves is gorgeous, you know. Mm. So it's a case of there's many leaves to choose from, and I found one very ovate sort of leaf that was sort of stuck in a bit of bark, and the leaf was in the process of decaying, so half of it was sort of brown. But because of the pigmentation, it changes. There was some reds and oranges in there. So I thought, yeah, I've got to capture this. And um, the lens I used was a macro lens, which picks up very fine detail. And uh, I suppose when you're taking a photo, you need to compose it. So I had a bit of green foliage in the background. And in the foreground was a bit of the natural gray brown bark of a tree. So it was a very nicely balanced composition, I think. And um, with the the solid, the red highlighted leaf right in the middle. And um, yeah, press the, press the shutter nice and gently and, um, and the rest is history, I suppose. So yeah, there you go. Yeah, it was like a, it was a gorgeous photo, and I think uh, all of the the comments around it, and, and obviously all of the the positive reactions you got as well. You ultimately were the winner, so um, clearly people really enjoyed the photo uh, as well. But um, yeah, I think it it, it, um, it was really beautifully captured, and and I guess Stuart, uh, that leads me to my next question. You are a um, uh, dabble a little bit into photography. How did how did you start getting involved in in um, taking photos of different things and especially of, of nature? Well, it's, as is often the case uh, with people's tangents, mine started, uh, I was actually influenced by my dad, who was a very keen photographer and I'm of the uh, vintage now where I was subjected to many a slideshow as a youngster. You know, this digital whiz-bang you got these days, it was sit down and sh -ch 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 go through a million slides. But slides, as some of your viewers would remember, there's something different about slides and photography because the light shines through the image. So it really, really illuminates it. Similar to what you know, your, 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 your computer screen is, visual, is illuminated mm -hmm. or slides used to be projected onto a screen or the wall and they just had more luminescence than, than a photograph. And so I was, I was really captured by Dad's slides and he had a lovely ectochrome camera. In itself, it was a beautiful silver thing in a, in a, a leather case. And I, I suppose, yeah, I, I was um, just enchanted by that. And 
I think he gave me a box brownie, like a brownie camera, which is a really old bit of kit. Um, when I was about 10 or 12, I got my first camera was an Olympus. This is in the old film days, no digital stuff. Probably I would have been a bit in late seventies, I suppose, an Olympus. And, um, yeah, that's when I started just taking photographs around my mates and just out in the bush and just sort of stuff that juveniles sort of get into. Get into and um, yeah, it all started there really. What's what what's your kid at the moment? What what are you using to take your photos right now? Well, as you see, I'm dressed in black, so I'm a Nikon man. All you Canon people out there, you white do-gooders. <laughs> I got to go with the black and black and yellow of Nikon. I mean, when I was growing up, uh, uh, Nikon's are very expensive cameras. Likewise, Canon's Olympus was big then. There's more diversity in camera brands now. There's, God, when you get your point and shoot cameras, there's just so much to choose from. But you know, I always used to use an SLR, so or a single lens reflex camera. And then I suppose the, the the dawning of time happened when digital photography came out. And for me, that was, um, you know, that was a re just a, a remarkable time where photography became more, um, what would you say, what's the word, economical, you know. You can take images and delete them. You delete them in the field. You delete them when you get home. And, and it just became much easier to process. To the lament of old school photographers um, and and professional photographers, because digital photography really did come in with a bang. And a lot of photographers were all of a sudden competing with talented amateur photographers, you know, and, you know, really, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes. Yeah. So photography in the last 20 years has really gone through a evolution, devolution, what do you want to call it? But it's far more accessible to, to everyone now. And now it's on... You know, a lot of good photographs I take, my Instagram stuff's all from my phone. I mean, they take, phones take quite reasonable photographs. And it's, I find I have a lot of fun taking photos with my Samsung phone, you know, because it's just there. Would so, you? Yeah, no, photography is a massive part of my life. I suppose it's a convenient way to express yourself artistically. That's a big part. My dad was a good drawer, cartoonist. Um, he he was he used to work at the Canberra Times with a cartoonist called Larry Pickering. So I've always been a fan of people like Larry Pickering, uh, Pryor, Jeff Pryor, and the fantastic artist Mr. Pope at the moment. I mean, on cartoonists, avoids Dad used to stick cartoons from the Canberra Times over the toilet wall, and I'd sit there sort of mesmerised looking at all these cartoons because they're very clever. You know, it's yeah. not just a drawing; it's the message and the the satire that goes with it. So, yeah, I suppose that's where a lot of my inspiration comes from for the technical side, I suppose. But uh, I suppose you can't take a photo unless you can see the photo first. And, and inspired photography starts within the person. You know, you see the image, it evokes something in you, you go, wow, I've got to capture that. And then the technical aspect comes in where you've got to try and you know, capture what you you can see in your eye and your brain uh, on film. It's not always easy, you know. Sometimes, like the old saying goes, you know, there's nothing. You know, oh, I can't remember how it goes now, but you know, basically the human eye sees stuff that cameras don't. And sometimes you just have to eat humble pie and say, well, I can't do justice to that. I think sun sunsets are often the case. Mm. Beautiful radiant sunsets. You can't sometimes do them justice with a camera, but you know. So, yeah, so photography really is an important part um, of my life. To my, my next question, Stuart, um, I think we're a bit out of order from what I gave you a heads up on, but um, it, was, it was your photo uh, of a very brightly coloured spider um, a bit over a decade ago that uh, um, caught the attention online on your Flickr account of some scientists and then... Uh, started off a whole chain of events for you and um, and has, has resulted in you being a, um, both a citizen scientist and a citizen science advocate. Uh, are you able to, to, to give us the, um, the, the short version of, of, 
uh, what you took a photo of and, and what happened next? Yeah, so that, that entailed a lot of the ingredients we just spoke about. I mean, I had been into bird photography for about three years, pretty full on. I had a big long lens for taking photos of birds, of which we've got many around beautiful Canberra and uh, up to 200 species in any given year sometimes. And, uh, but I'd been looking at Flickr, which is a photo sharing website. I'd been really inspired by looking at people's macro photography. So photographs of close up and small stuff. And it's another world in the macro world, micro, macro, however you want to say it. And so, but on that particular day, I had my macro lens with me, but I was out looking for a, a particular bird at Barumba Rocks. Um, oh God, it'll come to me. And I'll go mental blank about which bird it was, but I didn't see the bird. But as I was walking along the Barumba Rocks track, um, spotted quail thrush. It was a bird, probably never heard of it before, called a spotted quail thrush. Look it up, folks. And spotted quail thrush, beautiful. Anyway, so that bird didn't manifest. So I had the, I changed over to the macro lens and yeah, it was taking photos of everything small crawling along the track and took a photo of a little red and blue spider on a bright yellow leaf, which I thought in itself was photogenic, not necessarily significant, but yeah, within a couple of days I was getting um, comments on the photo I put on social media, which played a very important role. Off, you know, social media is often condemned for for some of the things that goes on there, but it also can be very uh, beneficial as well. And a scientist in America, who I had no idea who it was, uh, saw the photo and basically told me he it looked like a new species of peacock spider and that, uh, yeah, new to science and was his words. And uh, I thought, whoa, whoa, what does that mean? You know, shit, I've taken a photo of something that hasn't been known before. And it started quite a long journey, which is still going today. And um, yeah, it took me three years to find the, the spider again, which is pretty much the, the plot to the movie Maratus, shot a film by a wonderful Canberra filmmaker called Simon Koenig. And um, yeah, released in 2015, won a multitude of awards, all kudos to Simon. But it was a good story about science and citizen science combining successfully. And it's a true story. And uh, yeah, so. I mean, beyond that, I've gone on to find another, or be involved with it and find by myself another six species and one new genus of peacock spider. So it really has been quite a wild ride in the last 10 years. And, um, you know, all wild rides have their ups and downs. And a few years ago, there were some downs. There was a bit of bad blood. Um, I likened it to a gold rush once. Um, Myself and Dr. Jurgen Otto, the scientist, brought, and some other people brought um, these peacock uh, spiders into the into the media and the public eye. Oh, um, a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon, good and bad, and um, yeah, a few people threw some mud at me and sort of doubted my credentials and just had a go at my methods. And it really hurt. I'm even though I'm a big buffy guy, I'm quite sensitive, so. I thought, what am I doing this for? I don't get paid for it. I just do it because I love it. And, mm. and so it really had an effect. So I actually put the whole peacock spider thing away about three years ago and um, switched over to beetles, believe it or not. So now I'm a, a jewel beetle freak. And the last two years I've managed to delve into that um, tangent quite successfully as well. It, it, yeah. it sounds to me, so peacock spiders are... Um, they're, they're, a, they're a kind of jumping spider, but they're, they're also just stunning, aren't they? They really capture your eye. Is it the same for yeah, the jewel males, beetles? Yeah, the males. Jewel same. beetles, very similar, you know, very beautiful. Maybe I've got some little part of my brain that likes little, colourful, beautiful things. So, um, yeah, maybe that's why I like you, Tara, because of your hair. <laughs> I don't know, but anyway. But um, it's just, yeah, it's just... Something a tangent I'm on, and uh, it's something that uh, inspires me and makes me feel good. And um, yeah, it, it's 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 a, it's a passion, and and I can't see it burning out very soon. And and have you discovered um, some jewel beetles? No, well that's a much harder feat to do. I mean, it is possible. Um, 
Maratus harrisi, which I discovered in, well, it was named in 2011 after and me. After you, yes. Was, was, was the eighth species at yep. the time. Now, uh, keeping in touch with it, I think there's 86 species. So in just over 10 years, there's been nearly another 80 species added around Australia. And so it's gone from eight to 86 in, in, um, in, in less than 10 years. So hence what I talked about, the gold rush, the, the you know, we, we've, probably, we've probably broken the mother load. I'd say it'll, go, it'll surpass 100. I know there's still a few left to be described. There's one I was involved in at Mount Hotham in Victoria in 2016, 15, sorry, that still hasn't been described. So, um, you know, just because you find something doesn't mean it that, gets described immediately it can sometimes take years and if not a lifetime in some people's cases so yeah mm. so i've learned about a lot about science taxonomy and stuff like that along the way and and, yep. and why why is um why is it so important for uh citizens to be involved in in science and and what sort of role do you kind of see um, citizen scientists, you know, people like you having in the broader scientific field? Well, gee, that's a whole, it's probably a one hour discussion. So I'll try and be succinct. I'm not very good at that. Citizen science, you know, citizens doing science. Um, I can look at it two ways. People naturally, like, especially in a place like the bush capital, people like getting out in the bush. You're out there, you might be jogging, riding. Um, sometimes you slow down, you stop and you find something. Like a friend of mine, Aaron Clawson, who was riding a mountain bike and found a very rare spider orchid years ago. And now he's a prime mover behind Canberra Nature Map or the Nature Map program, which is being, and people like Michael Mulvaney, you know, just the success of that citizen science platform is phenomenal. Can you tell um, us about that? What the Canberra Nature Map? Yeah, I, I, I'm a bit wary about doing it because I, I want to be able to do justice to it and not leave anything out. But um, there's other people as well involved. Um, but let's just say with Michael, who's an ACT government representative of the environment, very hardworking, intelligent man, and, and, and Aaron, who's just a genius with IT and design and stuff. And together they put this thing where you basically the Canberra Nature Map site in particular, you put a photo up there and then a specialist or an expert will have a look at that and tell you what it is. So, you know, there's been numerous uh, new, I think there's been some new species discovered through that and, and range extensions, you know, ex things found around Canberra that they didn't know exist. You know, have all been found by citizen scientists just wandering around Black Mountain or around the bushland or Thugranong Hill or you name it. I mean, Canberra, the bush capitals, just chock a block full of great places to connect with nature. People's backyards, you know, it's uh, things with wings just turn up wherever they want, basically. So, um, and it gives pe some people purpose, you know. I know of some people, even some people sort of who've retired, or it gives them a real purpose to take a digital camera out there or the phone and just record what they see in the bush. But beyond that, beyond the actual goal, it's the therapeutic nature of it, just getting out. You know, a little bit of sun, a little bit of fresh air, you know, just smelling the, the trees, the bushes, the soil after rain, you know, stuff like that. It's good for the soul. I mean, without waffling on about it, I think people that have done it would realise what I'm saying. It's just good. It's good for the soul, you know. So, it kind of goes science, both, doesn't it? So it's like sorry? it's. It kind of goes both ways, doesn't it? Like it's a it's a reason well, to get out there. Citizen science be, has become a resource for science in itself mm. because science is getting funded less and less. Um, you know, there's more urgency with uh, climate change and loss of habitat and things like that to to record stuff. So science is using citizen science as a resource. But that's where another area, and I've spoken to you about this before, is that, I mean the possible exploitation that occurs where People are just seen as resources, and so there needs to be a value exchange in in, in citizen science, uh, its relationship with science, and it needs to be very needs to consider the human. And now it might sound judgmental and very shallow of me, but science sometimes doesn't consider the human. It's all about the results. It's all about the data, 
And um, so for me, citizen science is very much about the human experience in it as well. Um, it's always been part of real science, but it doesn't necessarily get documented. It's really part of the science story. And again, that's where the film Moratus shows the human side to scientific endeavour, not just the scientific achievements or the process in itself. Yeah. And so I think, I think from those, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. And, and, and the, even the term citizen scientist, citizen comes first, doesn't it? You know, it's the human element. Uh, that, that uh, should come first. But yeah, you, you might not often see uh, the human behind the science. And I think that's probably true for, for a whole heap of um, uh, science work that goes on. So yeah, Lovely. I reckon we could have a, another few hours on this. You're right. Um, Stuart, uh, my final question is, um, as well as being a, a, an advocate for citizen science, uh, science and scientists, um, yeah. you're uh, I think almost equally as big an advocate for your hometown of Belconnen. Um, oh yeah, you've uh, uh, lived here for <laughs> you've lived here for a while. You've got close ties here, and um, I think uh, Maratus even features the basement in there. Um, what does, it does yeah. what do, what does Belconnen and living here mean to you? And and what do you really like about Belconnen and the community around you? We all know that uh, Belconnen is the heavy metal capital of, of Australia um, and the basement and, and artists from Canberra have got a lot to do with that. I've always been a, I mean, I like all music, a lot of alternative music, but I've always been a metal fan. I'm a big Doom doom fan. I like it nice, slow and heavy. Um, but getting away from that, um, Belconnen, I mean, we moved here in 1968. I mean, I was born in England, but we moved here a year later in 66 when Dad got a job at the Canberra Times and my sister was born in 67. We lived in Ainsley and moved out to Page, good old Page, in 1968. And uh, when there was not many houses, there was not, nothing beyond Hickens in those days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, Tuggeranong didn't exist. No, Lake Dinandera didn't exist. I was just telling someone today that as a little boy, I remember walking along Ginandera Creek, walking along the actual ice on Ginandera Creek before where Flory is now. Wow. And there used to be a bike track at Page. We used to go down beyond the bike track and, and get up to all sorts of mischief down there, you know? So, you know, in those days, yeah, kids used to just go wandering out. And I recall an, an occasion walking along Ginandera Creek near where St. Francis Xavier is now in Flory and just being mesmerized by the beautiful dragonflies on a warm sort of mm -hmm. summer's day and just memories like that as a child they stay with you you know and it plants very fertile seeds in your psyche so maybe that's why now at age 54 i still get a real buzz out of just being in nature and mm. and that so yeah so i went to page primary school from 1971 to and then they pulled it down in 87 or something you know, there's townhouses there now. So that school just came and went in a flash, not even 20 years. Good old Page Primary School, big brown building. Everything was brown. Uh, uniforms are brown. The football jerseys are brown. No stripes, just brown. It's just brown. Everything was brown in those days. <laughs> and uh, and in Belcon and I was the same. It was brown, brown school. And, uh, yeah, it was just wonderful growing up here. You know, it was pretty rough. You know, it was rough down the old Wine Beggars Inn, Captain Greg's sort of leather bottle days, you know. The initiation as a young man, getting teeth knocked out and drinking too much and all sorts of stuff. Won't go into any details there, but, you know, it was a good bogan upbringing. But, you know, you, you, you cherish that, but you, you know, and it can be such a wonderful place. So many opportunities you can you sort of. I mean, I joined the Air Force when I was 19 and went away for 10 years. I came back to Canberra and I just saw the place differently. You know, after living around Australia and around the world, I saw Canberra, I appreciated it much more. And then I moved back to Belconnen in 2011 and I just love it and mm. live right in the town centre now. And what used to be called Emu Ridge, the post office now calls it Belconnen, but Greater Belconnen or whatever. But, um, 
And and do you yeah, recently, I mean, you recently got married at, at Lake Ginandera? Was that a, a really special for you? Why did you choose? Yeah, that? we got married on Bong Island, Bong Island, on in the John Knight Memorial Park. I mean, let's be honest, that's what the kids call it. And on the day of the wedding, we actually found an orchard bottle there with a little bit of hose hanging out of it. So I have never I, heard it called that. I can say that without guilt now because I don't smoke the stuff anymore. But um, you know. Lake Ginandera, John Knight Park, what a beautiful place, you know. You get superb parrots there, corellas, I mean, it's just gorgeous, all the water birds. People, look at it, what about it recently during the pandemic? You know, people, more and more people walking and cycling, it's been ridiculous. And from where I live in Belcon, and I, I probably do 100, 150 k's a week on my bike, ride out to Dunlop, ride out to the airport, all bike paths. What a wonderful, wonderful city where we can just get on a bike and ride for 40 50 k's and hardly have to cross the road you know show me another show me any other city in the world where you can do that um it's just great and um you know, belconnen is uh, very underrated and interesting to see it going up now it's going up isn't it yeah it is so. in, yeah vertically yeah so it's all progress I'm, i've got no objection to that Mm. I just hope the building standards are there, you know, I hope they don't, as long as they keep those building standards good and there's some pretty ugly buildings going up these days, I must say, my opinion. I, I, think, we, I think we're in uh, very firm agreement that uh, we, we need to have buildings that are of the highest standard and the highest calibre. Yeah, by the way, and even aesthetically, you don't, you know. Put a bit of thought into it, not just greedy developers just whacking it up, getting people in, you know. Put a bit of, have a bit of pride in your city, you know, have a bit of pride. You know, the days of NCDC, you know, when they're, they're sticking to the Burley Griffins plan, yeah, okay, that, that's that been outdated, but, you know, let's stick to a bit of quality. Canberra's a quality place. Don't chuck up all this cheap stuff, you know, have a bit of pride. And, and I'm just talking to the builders, I'm talking to, bloody developers and anyone who's involved in the process have a bit of pride and then the people the people reflect that you know as well yeah i i think um i think there's a, a lot of people out there myself included who um uh, share the same view Stuart. it's um yeah oh well you know i'm just honest you know that's one thing bill Connor teaches you is a bit of honesty <laughs> so I don't think anyone's right backwards in coming forwards. That's it. No, we're lucky. We're, we're lucky to have people like you, Stuart. And um, I think that's probably all we've got time for. But uh, there's so much more we could have spoken about today. But uh, um, you've had such a, um, a wide and varied career and wide and varied interests. And um, I think uh, it's been a real pleasure for me just to, to get to know you a little bit better. And, um, and I'm sure... Um, people in the Belconnen and wider community will feel the same, uh, just getting a, a bit of insight into someone that uh, they might run into on the street who uh, has discovered and is discovering a whole heap of species and contributing more broadly to science uh, in the ACT and Australia and, and I reckon the world. So thanks, Stuart. It's been a real pleasure. And I, I'm sure a lot of people join me in saying thank you to you for your very straightforward and approachable um, stewardship of your your responsibility and position in the government and um, it's a really it's been a wonderful breath of fresh air for all of us uh, over a few years now and uh, we hope that you go along into the future with yeah. your um, with the flavor of your, your of your of the way you do things so thank you oh, thanks Stuart that's very very kind all right we will leave it there and um thank you to all of you for joining us and yeah belco rocks <laughs>